One of the reasons that functions are so popular in, in later mathematics is that we have a really neat way that we can write and denote things. Uh, we call it function notation, and a lot of times you'll see things written like this. Uh, if you're looking at some sort of a function, we'll see this type of notation like that looks like this. Now normally when you see letters next to each other like this, we think of multiplication, but that is not the case when we look, are looking at functions or um, and function notation. When I see a statement that looks like this, I read this as f of x. So when I say that in our videos here, um, that's, that's what this is talking about. When we look, what each of these different pieces are give us um, an important piece of information. Uh, the f is the name of my function. Now keep in mind, these are variables and, and uh, of one type or another, so you could have g of x or h of x. Uh, we often use f of x because f stands for function, so it's kind of nice. Uh, x is the variable that we use for our input value. So if you see a statement like this, this means I have a function f and I'm, I'm going to input the value of x or use x as my input value. Um, now, if you see f of x, a lot of times we treat f of x and y the same. And the reason is if you take an input of x and apply the function to it, I get y as an output value. So these are kind of some common ways that you can talk about this. But do, writing things in this way is really nice for a lot of reasons. Um, it, it defines what the input value is, what you're looking for and expecting, and it also gives you a way that you can talk about talk about what the rule is as you go through and do that. Let's go down here and uh, use this table of values to talk a little bit about how we read this uh, f of x, or in this case, p of x. Now I think we got a typo over here. If p is my function, then we should be looking at p for all of my functions here. Now let's go through and see if we can figure out um, what each of these values means. So for part a here, it's asking us to find p of 9. What that means is 9 is my input value, and I want to see the output that I get when I apply the function p. So if I look up here, if 9 is my input value, then the output value that, go along, that goes along with that is negative 3. So we can read our chart that way. Here, this says that I'm going to do the function p, and my input is going to be negative 3. All right, so we go to our input line is here. If I have negative 3, it goes to um, 15 when I evaluate that. So this is a short way that we can write. I'm going to put 9 in, get negative 3 as a result. I'm going to put negative 3 in, get 15 as a result. All right. now. In part C and D, we're being asked a completely different question. What we're looking for here, we're looking for what is the input value? What could I put in for the input to get 13 out as the output? So in this case, I'm going to look at the output values down here. I'm looking for 13, and I'm looking for the input value that gives me that, and that's negative 1. So what that means is that P of negative 1 is equal to 13, or we could say that x equals negative 1 gives us the value that we need um, in order to make this particular statement true. Here, this is the same idea. I'm going to do my function p. I don't know what, what input I have, but I want 0 to be my output. So we look down at for where is 0 the output value and see which input value goes along with that. So in this case, it's 5. So we would say that p of 5 is equal to 0. Or we can say that at x equals 0, we have this condition that applies. Oh, sorry, at x equals 5. Try that again. If 5 is my input, then 0 is my output. So um, p of 5 is equal to 0. All right. Now, in terms of additional vocabulary when we talk about functions, we often talk about what's called the domain and the range. These are really... Uh, interesting and useful pieces that have a lot of mathematical meanings, and we'll see that this over the course of the, of the rest of the quarter. The domain is the set of all possible input values. And the range is the set of all possible output values.
Now, because our inputs are usually x, because usually we talk about f of x, and our outputs are usually y, you can also think of this as the domain is the set of all possible x values, and the range is the set of all possible resulting y values. So when we identify the domain and the range, here the domain is the set of all possible inputs, which is going to be everything up here in this top row. So our, do our values in our domain are negative 3, negative 1, 0, 5, and 9. Now if you notice that uh, here we have the word set, uh, set it has another specific type of notation that's really useful to it to us. If we're talking about set notation, which is the nice mathematically proper way that we can write our answers, here's just a couple of things to keep in mind. We put the possible values in squiggly brackets. We separate all of our possible values with commas and list them all out. We want to put our numbers in order from smallest to largest when possible. And lastly, we do not want to include any repeated values. Um, so the set is just each possible thing that would actually work. So if something shows up, um, shouldn't show up in the domain, but in the range, you might see some repeated values that, that uh, you wouldn't have to write more than once when you do that. All right, so let's take a look at our next piece here. We want to identify the range of P of X. That's going to be the output values. So 15, 13, 10, 0, and negative 3. Again, we'll use the squiggly brackets to denote our to denote our set, and then we want to write the values in order from smallest to biggest. So in this case, negative 3 is the smallest, 0, 10, 13, and 15 make up our set. All right, so with that in mind, let's just look at a variety of other ways that um, function we can look at functions in order to identify inputs and outputs and uh, get a little bit more familiar with this function notation. All right, so here in problem 12, here we have a function that we call g, and we have a set of ordered pairs. Remember when we're looking at our set of ordered pairs, the first value in the ordered pair goes along with the x, which is our input value. The second value in your ordered pair is the matching y, or output value, for our list. So let's go through and identify each of the things that they're asking for us in this problem. So for a, we want to evaluate g of 0. This means look at the function g, put 0 in as your input, and see which output value you get. Well, if 0 is my input, I need to look at the x-coordinate of each of the ordered pairs. This is 3, not helpful. Ah, here we go. Here I have an input of 0 with an output of 2. 4 and negative 2. So there's going to be my solution. For part b, I'm looking for applying the function g to 4, with 4 as an input. So we're finding g of 4. So we come up here and we look for 4 as an input. So we look at our first coordinates for x. Here it is. And then we look at the output that goes along with it is 8. So g of 4 is equal to 8. For part c and d, we're being asked a completely different question. Here I want to apply my function g to something. i got to figure out what to put in there. And when I use that input, I want to get 1 out as an output. So in this case, because 1 is the output value, I need to look at the y-coordinates of my, of my points. Um, so here's our y-coordinates, 1, 2, 8, and 8. Uh, I want to know where my output value is equal to 1, and that happens when the input value is 3. So you can say that g of 3 is equal to 1, or when x is equal to 3, this particular condition applies. For d, we want to find the value of x, or the input value, when um, so that when I apply my function g, I get 8 as a result. Now if you look up here at the y values, notice that 8 is a result twice, because two different values get mapped to it. So in this case, we do have two different solutions, um, and that's okay when we're given an output because uh, as long each input is unique. So here we can say that g of 4 is equal to 8, and g of negative 2 is equal to 8. Or we can say for the values, for the x values of negative 2 and 4, we have these particular conditions apply. For E and F, we just want to identify the domain and range. Remember, this is just the set of all points that meet a certain condition. Uh, the domain is the set of all X or input points. So we want to look at our uh, X values. So we have 3, 0, 4, and negative 2. Put them in order from smallest to biggest. We have negative 2, 0, 3, 4, and that would be my domain. Um, 
lot of times you'll see that written with a D like that, and then the range like this. Uh, in this case, the range is the set of all possible Y values. The Y values are 1, 2, 8, and 8. Put them in order from smallest to biggest. We do not need to repeat the 8 value when we're using set notation. All right. In problem 13, uh, we look at things a little bit differently. In this particular case, they give us several different um, values, but they are all given to us in function notation. So we're going to think a little bit backwards here. Uh, for part A, we're being asked to identify the domain of F. So if we're looking for the domain of F, what we're looking for is the input values that we see. Now remember, when we use our function notation, we always have the function of our input value. So the 2 will be an input, the 4 will be an input, and the 0 will be an input. Again, we're, we're going to go ahead and put that in our set notation in order of numbers from smallest to biggest. So our domain here is going to be the point 0, 2, and 4. The range is the set of outputs that we get in our function, and the outputs are what those... So I can evaluate the function f with an input of 2, and I get 7 as a result. So here, my outputs are 7 and 15 and negative 2. So we can go through and identify those and write them in order from smallest to biggest. And that would be my range. The last part of the problem here asks us to write the function as a set of ordered pairs. So in this particular case, we want to write a set. Each of these statements correlates with an ordered pair. So my input of 2 to my function gives me an output of 7. So the point 2, 7 is an ordered pair representing uh, my function. Here I get another point. f of 4 is equal to 15, means that if 4 is my input or x value, 15 is my output or y value. And here I have a third point. 0 is an input value with negative 2 as an output value. If I'm doing this in set notation, there's our squiggly brackets. You should separate each ordered pair with a comma. Uh, in this case, because our ordered pairs are pairs of values, it's a little bit harder to think about, you know, what would be the order that you put them in from smallest to biggest. So uh, nothing really to stress too much about there, uh, as long as you have all three of those points in your solution. Um, finally, at the very end here, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, evaluating functions and working with function notation when we're given a formula as our rule instead of just a, a chart or a table or a set of ordered pairs. Uh, in the formula, notice here what this means is if x is my input, I'm going to get my output value by multiplying that number by 3 and then adding 2. I'm actually given a numerical rule. This way is really, really great when you're talking about evaluating functions because you can use one rule explanation to talk about lots and lots of things that are happening. All right, so it looks a little bit strange the first couple of times you do it, but here what it's asking us to do is it's trying to ask us to find to use the, uh, to evaluate the function when my input value is 2. So if I come up here at f of 2, what I'm being asked to do is put 2 in for the input into my rule. So 3 times my x value, which I'm going to use 2 for, plus 2. And then we just follow order of operations to evaluate this particular function. 3 times 2 is 6, 6 plus 2 is 8, and that's my um, function notation evaluation here. So f of 2 is equal to 8, and I can write that out that way. Now, in part b, it's asking us a very different function. It's going to ask us to find when f of x is equal to negative 5. So what this means is I don't know what the input value is, but I want to figure out which input value I can do so that I get negative 5 as an answer. Well, let's go back up here to our problem. Here, so my original function says f of x is equal to 3x plus 2. I want to know when f of x is equal to negative 5. So that's my output. So I'm going to have negative 5 equals 3x plus 2. And I'm being asked to find the input or find the x values where this works. Well, what does this look like? This just looks like a nice little equation that I can solve for x, and that's exactly what you want to do. So we're going to go back and really revisit solving a lot of equations. It's just that we're going to see the questions being worded slightly differently using this function notation. So not really any new math to learn, just a, a getting used to the notation. So here to get x by itself, we're going to subtract 2 from each side. It gives me negative 7 equals 3x. 
and then wrap up by dividing by three on each side. And again, right, leaving your answers as a simplified fractions is totally appropriate. So when x is equal to negative 7 thirds, this particular statement is true. You could also write my answer just in full blown out function notation. f of negative 7 thirds gives me an output of negative 5. And that's an, this statement of what we were able to, to solve and figure out. In g of x, same concept again. Here I have uh, my function's name is g, my input is x, and this is the rule that I'm going to use. So in part a, where it's asking us to find g of negative 2, notice that the negative 2 is in the x position, and that's the input that I want to use. Um, so I have 2 times x was negative 2 squared, minus 3 times x shows up again, so I use negative 2 again. So I have to use that input twice in my rule to come up with my solution. And then again from here you can plug that whole thing in your calculator or go through and evaluate uh, following order of operations. Um, negative 2 squared gives me a positive 4. 2 times positive 4 is 8. Here negative 3 times minus 2 gives me a plus 6 and then plus 1 and I can uh, add those from left to right. 14 plus 1 gives me 15 as a result. And so g of negative 2 is equal to 15. Uh, again, when you, uh, when you are uh, applying input values, it's a really great idea to put them in parentheses when you go to evaluate them. So uh, like in this particular situation here where we had x squared, we have to make sure that we square that negative as part of that, as part of that process. All right, last type of example here. Uh, here we want to find when g of x is equal to 0. So this means that we want to find the x values where this works. So find the x for this output of 0. So we start out, here's our g of x function. g of x equals 2x squared minus 3x plus 1. I want my g of x to be equal to 0, and now I have an equation with only one variable in it. So this is the equation that I need to solve. Unfortunately, I have an x squared and an x both in the problem, and so I can't just undo order of operations stuff. Instead, I've got to use my quadratic function tools, which means get one side of the equation equal to zero, and then either factor or use the quadratic formula to solve. In this particular case, factoring works really well. Uh, notes, remember, the quadratic formula always works, so if you like the quadratic formula better, go for it. But in this case, if we do 2x times x to get the 2x squared, 1 times 1 to get 1, and then use minuses for both of these. Uh, the negative 1 times negative 1 gives us the positive 1. Um, we end up with negative 2x minus 1x gives us the negative 3x in the middle that we need. So this actually factors out pretty well, and then we can set each factor equal to 0. So 2x minus 1 equals 0, and x minus 1 equals 0, and then we can solve each of these. So 2x equals 1, divide by 2 on each side, uh, and we get x equals 1 half as one solution. Over here we can just add 1 to each side and we can get x equals 1 as our second solution. And those are the same answers you'd find if you used the quadratic formula. Again, if you prefer writing your answer in function notation, we can say that g of 1 half equals 0. So if 1 half is my input, I apply the function g, I should get 0 as an output. And then we can also say that g of 1 is equal to 0, same deal. If I put 1 in for my input and evaluate it, I get 0 out as my output. So answers in either this form or in this form are going to be acceptable for what I'm looking for.